Morning. It looks like it's going to be another beautiful day here in central Illinois. The only thing that could make this better is if we were planting today. Speaking of beautiful, there's our new to us Hagee sitting at our John Deere dealership. Just needs to run through the shop and then it'll be all ours. As to whether or not owning and operating your own sprayer is a good thing, I guess we'll find that out very shortly. I wonder if it's locked. Halfway tempted to climb up there and just sit down in it. These sprayers look a lot different up close than they do in pictures. I have found one silver lining to being average in height. I can walk under this without having to bow down. I'm not even in the cab yet. I can already tell that this thing is going to be a lot of fun. Assuming it's not also a nightmarish, unreliable machine. I'm optimistic that I picked a good one, but who knows? I'm guessing that it's not locked and I would be correct. Yeah, I can tell you already there's gonna be a bit of a learning curve here for me. Operates much different than our John Deere equipment. If I'd gotten a brand new Hagee, which one I couldn't afford them, and two, there weren't any available, it had a cab design similar to a John Deere Combine, an S-Series or an X9. The hydrostat was all the same. This 2020 model is still the Hagee system, so it's set up like that. Seems like a pretty simple machine, but like I said, I'll have to do some learning as we go. Out of every option it has, the most important one is right here under the steering wheel. That's the footrests. Once you have them on something, you just can't operate without them. Since I'm not taking this home today and they still have to run it through the shop, I'm not going to talk extensively about this sprayer. I'll give you my first thoughts, which I'll probably repeat in a future video. First thought is that this cab needs an air freshener. It's kind of stinky but that happens when someone operates in something like this for a while. You don't even want to smell the inside of my dad's planter tractor. Just the sweatiness and oil and grime from getting in and out of the cab all day adds up pretty quickly. Second thought is that this machine actually looks significantly better than it appeared to me when I looked at it. Of course, I was in a dimly lit machine shed on a terrible rainy day. We're out on a nice spring day, so that could bias my opinion a little bit. Overall though, we may have our hands on a Pretty solid machine, at least visually. Oh, I better stop daydreaming and get to work and do something that's actually productive as opposed to sitting in a sprayer that isn't even technically mine yet. I may go take a run of my luck in the shop, seeing if I can get the mechanics to put the floaters on this for me. That would be a great deal. I hope you're all ready for some awesome content. Should be an exciting summer for us. Hey, I wanted to take a quick break from the action to thank the sponsor of today's video, AG1. AG1 is a comprehensive daily nutrition made powerfully simple. It's made up of 75 high quality whole food sourced ingredients, including vitamins, minerals, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens, carefully curated to nourish all of the body's systems holistically. AG1 tackles two of the most important health needs, the nutrients that your body needs each day and it provides a foundation of long-term gut health, providing a variety of benefits. As someone who's very busy this time of year, I can attest to how quick and convenient of a daily habit AG1 is. First thing in the morning after I wake up, I pop a serving of this in a shaker, mix it up, put it down the hatch. It is completely enjoyable to drink. It's not unsufferable like a lot of multivitamin products. As we speak, I am in the heart of planting season, meaning that the grind is at an all time high. I love the fact that I'm consuming a product every day that supports my body's ability to produce energy as well as mental clarity. Those two things are a godsend for me as we deal with the mental gymnastics that is planting season. Again, AG1 is quick, effortless, and easy. It's a great way to combine multiple different products into one effortless daily habit. If you are interested in trying AG1, head over to athleticgreens.com forward slash atrippy farmer to get started on your order today. The team at AG1 is generous enough to offer anyone from my community on their first order a free one year supply of vitamin D3 and K2, as well as five free travel packs. I highly recommend you check out AG1. It's a great product. I use it every day. I appreciate them sponsoring today's video. Now let's get back to the action. That tile inlet we replaced in the last video sure does look nice now. It almost looks like it was there from the start and it's kind of hodgepodge together underneath, but no one can see that part. You can only see the beautiful inlet on top, not the mess that's holding it together underneath. You know what they say though, some of the most important things in the world are held together by duct tape, zip ties, and in this case, a bag of quick crete. An unacquainted individual would think that all there is to a sprayer is the machine, and then of course something to put product in the tank, and that could not be further from the truth. 
there's a lot of other legwork and calculations and decisions that have to be made in regards to the products you're applying and how you apply them. More specifically, I'm talking about this box full of $3,000 worth of sprayer, nozzle caps, and tips. I'll talk about the details of these more extensively in a video when I'm actually setting up the sprayer once it's in our possession, but these are a requirement to put on the nozzle bodies of the sprayer to alter the carrier volume capacity, the spray pattern, and a few other things, droplet size. Each individual chemical, the carrier rate, and also the type of carrier you're using directly affects the nozzle selection. There are certainly a lot of product types that are relatively interchangeable. One tip could probably do multiple different chemistries, but on the other side, if you wanna do your job properly, you will have to make adjustments for other chemicals. Between this bag on the left and the box of unassembled parts on the right, I have 400 nozzle tips, nozzle caps, and gaskets that need assembled. Like I said, adult Legos, but much more expensive and arguably less exciting. Regardless of the type of tip I ordered, I did go with T-Jet on everything. They're a pretty reputable company, probably one of the biggest names in spray equipment. And for sales and service, I ordered these online through Janssen Spray Equipment. They have a pretty diverse selection of spray parts, not just T-Jet, a lot more than that. And they have a tremendously solid reputation online, so felt good supporting a local company. They're just down in Newton, which isn't even 30 miles away. So going through them was a pretty easy choice. I'm gonna sit down here, start assembling these. It'll probably take me an hour or two because there's quite a few. I have actually already done 100 of them in this bag right here, that's why they're separate. Here we have a T-Jet AIXR air inducted extended range size six in a T-Jet cap. And then there's that gasket on the inside. Altogether right here, you're looking at about $7.50, $8 maybe. I could be off on that. And there's a hundred of them in this bag. And I've got three more sets to put together. The only shining light is that I'm in my parents' sunroom so I can at least enjoy the sunshine today. I've been sitting here for a little while just plugging away at this project. I'm averaging about two or three tip and cap and gaskets per minute. I've done close to 200. I'm about done with the second set. The first set of size six T-Jet AIXRs I already had done. I did them the other day. I did make one error. I have these size eight T-Jet AIXRs which require a bigger cap than what I ordered. The cap color actually doesn't mean anything other than just having uniformity with the tip itself. These three sets right here all have the same cap size requirement. The size eight is a tad bit bigger. It's for higher carrier rates and speeds. So it's the same nozzle as that one over there, just not gonna fit in the nozzles I ordered. So I had to order some more of those. So I only have about 300 ready to go. I'm not even exactly sure how many nozzle bodies are on the Hagee. I think it's right around 100, maybe a few more, a few less. I ordered 10 extra of everything, so I should have plenty and then some backups if it comes to that. For the most part, this isn't anything other than just simple busy work that has to be done in preparation for the sprayer. While I'm sitting here grinding away at this project, I wanted to make a really informal comment about the Farm Rescue organization. I'm sure some of you are familiar with Farm Rescue from uh, Zach Johnson, AKA the Millennial Farmers video last fall. He basically summarized what they do in his video by showing up to a farmer in needs place to help volunteer to help remove their crop. Zach explained everything pretty thoroughly. He wasn't bringing his equipment to save the day. Farm Rescue exists as a nonprofit to help serve farmers and ranchers that find themselves in a troublesome situation. It could be as simple as a natural disaster wiping out some of their equipment or their ability to complete their farming tasks. It could be some kind of injury sidelining the farmer for a prolonged period of time, and it could even be a tragedy. Obviously, we don't wish any of those on anyone, but an organization like Farm Rescue exists to help fill that gap with no strings attached. If someone's farm has fallen on tough times due to circumstances in life, upon request or approval from the operator who's sidelined or from the next of kin, they will show up with either their own lineup of equipment that is high-tech, new, and very productive, or they'll bring just volunteers to help run the operator's own equipment that's already there. The purpose of Farm Rescue is to serve as a lifeline for farms who've caught a run of bad luck, and they need someone or something to bridge the gap 
until either they themselves can be healed as farmers or until the next generation can get things figured out to see how the future of the farm is going to develop. Farming is something that is both community and performance oriented. There is a lot of family values in farming which make navigating some of these times very difficult for operations. That's not to mention that whoever you bring in to help on your farm, you have an expectation that they're going to do quality work, which Farm Rescue is very big on, is training their operators and volunteers to be able to lead these teams to plant crops, harvest crops, feed cattle, and everything from A to Z on a farm, and do so in a very high quality fashion. So you know that if Farm Rescue shows up, that you can count on them to take care of that farm in the given time constraint and do a great job with no strings attached like I mentioned earlier. I'm sure many of you are asking, Andy, why are you even bringing this up? Well, the great folks at Farm Rescue have expanded into Illinois. They were typically just in the Western Corn Belt and Great Plains, and they've since moved their way east. Illinois is going to be their farthest east state and they moved here this spring. So if any of you are from Illinois or any of the states that already has farm rescue presence and you know of someone in need, do not hesitate to reach out to them. It is worth a phone call. Like I said, no strings attached. I've repeated that a bunch, but I think that's really important because these are very difficult waters to navigate, especially when there's a loss of life, tragedy, or even something as simple as equipment getting lost in a tornado or storm. Everyone, please keep Farm Rescue in mind if you're in Illinois or any of the other states because they're a very viable option to help keep farms afloat when things don't go their way. I know this isn't the most formal presentation of what they have to offer. Maybe at some point I'll be able to volunteer with them as well. I'd like to think that I'm an experienced operator, but some of you probably would disagree in the comments. At the bare minimum, go over to the Farm Rescue website and check out what they have to offer. It is a tremendous resource and I can see why that's something that the farming community could really benefit to have established. And just like that, we have 300 spray nozzles ready to go. In unironic fashion, the only one that I actually need ready to go are these size 8 air ducted extended range T-Jets. But Jensen spray equipment should have those sent over pretty shortly, so we'll worry about that later. I would be amiss to pass up an opportunity to talk about drainage while I'm also talking about the potential for more storms. As is tradition, anytime we want a basis for our drainage issues, we go down here to what I would affectionately call our ground zero for ponding. This 125 acre field where we have the two 24 inch tile systems, I'm sure some of you are tired of looking at it, but this is always where we go to look at things. And I also want to do some research while I'm out here. Before I dive into the details on what's going through my mind with this farm, I do want to highlight the fact that over the last two weeks, we probably had a total of four inches of rain. So over hundred millimeters for you folks that don't use freedom units. That is a relatively substantial amount of rainfall. Although if it was spanned out over the course of a week, it's not really that much for our soils and drainage systems to handle. When it comes in short bursts though, it can be quite a load for any of our systems. With that being said, it's been roughly five days since the seizing of the rainfall. We haven't had any additional moisture since then. And to be honest, fairly decent weather for drying. Far from perfect, but still better than cold weather. You can see out here the phenomenon that we will refer to as graying off in spots. That's something that I'm sure you'll hear me repeat a lot this spring. It is just a visual indication that the ground is dry on top in spots. Of course, underneath those spots that appear dry on top could be complete mud. So it's not really a foolproof idea that your ground's dry, though it does showcase areas that are drying quicker than their counterparts. This field is a perfect example of that, especially today where you can see the pockets out there that are really starting to get dry, like right here on this hill. You look further out, there's some damper soil. That's exactly what I'm here to look at. Not because I'm concerned about how dry it is, like we're gonna be planting it anytime soon because that's highly unlikely. More specifically, I'm evaluating the potential for expanding our drainage tile system, our subsurface drainage out on this farm beyond what we did last fall. In a few different videos last fall, I talked about the state of the drainage system out on this farm. We had a few different problems going on. One of our not very old sub mains was half full of mud, meaning it wasn't draining at full capacity. We had laterals full of mud and silt, and we also had laterals that for a reason unbeknownst to us had completely disintegrated. 
I guess it's not unknown to us. We know exactly what happened, or at least my dad claims that the original plastic tile they used was not engineered properly. They didn't use enough UV blockers in it, so it deteriorated over time. The northern half of this farm was patterned on 90 foot spacings with sub laterals running through the field, five inches. Like I said, they were all completely disintegrated. You probably could have touched them and they'd fall apart. Needless to say, they were not draining because not only were they falling apart, they were full of mud too, which is not good to see because if you take the current value of a system of this size, it's pretty substantial financial replacement. To make a long story somewhat shorter, this fall we had set aside a certain amount of capital to reinvest into this farm in particular and improve the drainage. We spent all of that money and then some, and we didn't even actually do any additional drainage work beyond the original system. All of those funds went to repairing what was broken out there and probably causing more issues than what we had. We fixed all that. Now we're exploring the idea of putting some more laterals in but we'd like to do so on a more concise budget. The reason I explained graying off to those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's pretty much an indicator of what areas of the field have more soil saturation than others. You can then use that visual indicator to kind of surmise what parts of the field are going to take yield loss from multiple rainfall events because saturated soils and a lack of oxygen to the roots as a result equals yield loss. That is where you see these tile drainage systems really pay off, especially in soybeans, because they get a lot of that water out of the soil pore spaces, allow oxygen in, that way your plants can actually breathe a little bit as opposed to suffocate. To circle back around to my infrastructure conversation earlier, this entire 125 acre farm, give or take 10 acres that is on the hill that doesn't need drainage, has tile systems or laterals on 90 foot centers. We repaired everything, it should be functioning on 90 foot centers. We would like to split it, though the finance department is a little hesitant to invest much more money in this farm after the fiasco we had last fall with everything being worn out and broke down. I'm gonna take the drone out for purposes other than vanity, a legitimate surveying mission here to see if there's areas in particular in this field where I can actually put more laterals as opposed to going across the entire field and splitting it on 45 foot centers or even 30, which some people do. I'm not saying 30 wouldn't pay, but we're looking to be more efficient with our money. We want to really address the worst areas. And then we would proceed to move on to another farm and start working on the worst areas there because your money is best spent addressing that lower end of your spectrum with the worst drainage because a lot of these other areas it would not give us the same financial return because there's just not as much to be gained by fixing area that already drains fairly good versus going and fixing something that's still a swamp. So the reason I got my drone up is so I can go out here and see today if there's areas that are draining or not draining. Right now I'm flying on the east side of the property looking towards the west and making my way north for a panning shot of this field as a whole. 125 acres, like I said, so a fairly large field. It's shaped in a convenient fashion for farming. It's actually pretty easy to cover a lot of ground out here, assuming you don't get stuck. At first glance, you're already going to be able to tell the areas that are super wet versus the ones that aren't as wet. One thing I will ask you to keep in mind is that some of these little humps you see evenly spaced on the left side of the video are actually new tile lines that we put in last fall. The reason that those look exceptionally dry is because there is still a hump of soil from where that pipe was installed that creates elevation, meaning that the surface water gets off of that area faster, allowing it to dry. Now I'm sure that it is also drier because it has a new subsurface line under there, but the main effect you're seeing is that it is fairly dry because of the soil piled up. As I work my way to the north, I'm still focused on what I would consider the worst area of the farm in terms of drainage issues and of course yield loss. Right there on the left side of the image right now is the field ditch that drains the majority of that surface water to the ditch on the road here where both of our tile inlets are sitting in the ditch. I can already see one area in particular right on center screen to the top that definitely could use some more subsurface lines installed. If you just look at that area, it's fairly damp compared to its neighbors. For my own record keeping, once I finish this video, I'm actually going to probably take a few pictures and then pull them up on my computer and draw up places where I think we need to look at better drainage. Overall though, I'd say this farm is actually in much better shape than it was five years ago when those drainage issues really started to kick off. 
Obviously, it makes sense now knowing the shape of those subsurface lines. A plugged or open tile underground can actually cause more issues than having no tile systems at all. They're your best friend and your worst enemy at the same time. We've now pretty much made it to the north end of this field. This is where we replaced all of the tile that had the UV issues. It completely degraded in the ground. You can see those laterals in here. And you go a little bit farther, you can see some higher elevations, a lighter soil that's also dried quicker. To be honest with you all, that's an area where we wouldn't even waste the money to tile. Though it does look like there are a few lines out there. So who knows? The crazy thing is, is that there's multiple years of tile in this farm. It wasn't like this was all put in 10 years ago or 30 years ago. There could have been old clay tiles installed 100 years ago, and then more 80 years ago, and then maybe more 50 years ago, and then 30 years ago, my dad came in after he bought this farm and put all these subsurface plastic lines in, and then 10 years later, he could have put more in, and then in the present day, more in. The sad part about that is, is you really have no idea where the old clay lines are, except for if they show up on a picture like this. So the drone actually does serve some purpose. Ladies and gentlemen, I do not think I could have picked a better day to do this. This is exactly the stage you want the soil to be in in terms of dryness to visualize the areas that are troublesome. I flew across the road to another one of our farms. It's a dark soil that would benefit from advanced drainage on the farm. And you can clearly see where some tiles already exist and also areas that really could use a little bit more tile. Top left side of the screen here, dark drummer Flanagan, high productivity soil. There's a wet spot out there. We cross the drainage ditch, work our way to the east side of the same field. We farm it as one field other than having to cross the bridge. We can't farm through the drainage ditch, obviously, although I'm sure some people have tried before. You see that the backside is also very wet, something that I'm sure would show up on a yield monitor, especially in a wet year if you had soybeans out here. You can see more pre-existing tile lines out there. This actually might give us a little bit to work off of, and I can definitely see a case to be made of some areas of this field that would greatly benefit from some more tile systems. It's kind of a fun little project to take the drone out and look at this. I will say that soybean stubble that is going into corn seems to visualize this better than corn stalks, just because the moisture is much more obvious to the naked eye when you're flying above it. I've just continued to work my way east here. We actually own quite a few fields next to each other. This one is corn stalks, so like I said, may not be able to visually see the difference as well, though I do think I see a bunch of laterals on this farm. My dad would know where everything is because a lot of these newer laterals he would have installed himself or paid to install them. At least with the newer lines, you know where they are. Some of these old clays, it's kind of just like a wild goose chase, whether or not you hit them with the tile plow or the trencher, and you hope that you can hook them in. It looks like this farm does have some room for improvement on the southeast corner here, the bottom right side of the screen. I'm on the south side of it. There is a fair amount of wetness out there, though it is far from our worst field. I've flown to another one of our farms in the same area. I'm just on the south side of the big ponding field we have, and it's really cool to see how interconnected all of these tile systems are, even across the road from each other, probably weren't even owned by the same person at one point in time. You see all of these lines are feeding into our main system here on the north side of the road where we've invested all this money to drain it, but it's not just our main field or the target field that's being drained, they're so much more connected. It's just like a spider web of infrastructure under these fields. I'm speculating that the field I'm flying over right now, which is to the south, like I said, probably old clay tiles. We have not laid any plastic out here in my memory, so gotta be old systems. You can see some tire tracks where we've had tile holes fixed out here. This thing could probably use a little bit more work. And if you see this really wet area in the middle to right side of the screen right now, I would bet that that ponding is probably caused by one of these old clay tile systems that's broken down in a very inconvenient spot, causing water to bubble. If we could just unplug that, find the issue, it might fix that because we've been farming around a mud pit there for 10 years now. This is actually going so well right now with the level of moisture in the soil and the amount of it that's drying at the same time that I may fly around to a few more farms and check out what drainage systems I'm seeing. I'd like to make a Rolodex of sorts for all of our fields 
so we can reference them to see if there's tile lines out there that we should be concerned about if we consider going out there and putting more in. One thing that usually happens with these old clay tiles is that a lot of them are often lower than the new tiles that are going in. I don't know why that is, but it happens quite a bit. Some of these fields, when we lay the new laterals in over top, they just happen to be shallower than the old clays that were laid almost a century ago. Which seems backwards, because you would think when someone with a shovel was digging the trench, they'd be a lot less motivated to go into the ground like a self-propelled tile plow or big wheel trencher. Since I started at our farm with the worst drainage, it only makes sense that I'd move to the farm with the second worst drainage right after. Here we have an 80 on the south side of the road and a 70 on the right side of the road. I talked about this one last video or two videos ago. We've got the anhydrous pipeline that cuts across it and we have a pretty major ponding issue on the north side. Overall though, the whole thing needs some advanced drainage work done to it. Here I am right in between the two fields facing north. This is a 70 acre field like I mentioned. It's not completely square. The neighbor owns a little bit of that corner to the northwest. This is cornstalk, so it's a little bit more difficult to see any kind of existing drainage systems. You can definitely see a few things running diagonal across the farm from the southeast corner and some things splitting the farm in the middle, though the investment out here looks minimal. This is one of our better farms on paper other than the massive drainage issues. And we're not the only ones struggling with that because you can see the neighbors all around also have a fairly large amount of water. We just get the bulk of it here in the southeast corner of this field. Usually corn stalks moved around in this volume are a good indicator that there's been some major ponding and water issues on this farm. I moved to the farm across the road, but I also relocated to the west side. So the farm we just looked at is on the left side of the screen to the north, if you're looking at it from a compass. We've changed visualization directions here. This is the 80. It is a square 80. You can see there is a decent amount of drainage systems out here, though the farm is still fairly wet, especially through the middle. Phenomenal farm ground on both sides of the road. Typically some of our best yielding crops, assuming we don't get a monsoon. The actual old tile main that I believe is an 18 inch clay, maybe even 24, runs through the middle of this 80 here. The halfway point for this farm is about two thirds of the way up your screen. It runs from the corner of our farm that has all the ponding issues on the left side of the screen all the way across our farm on the south and allegedly this main in particular which is a drainage district tile meaning there's multiple people involved in ownership and taxing bodies and all of that jazz it's complicated discussion it runs over a mile someone may have told me it's two miles i don't know if that's true or not but it does not keep up for the amount of rainfall we have collected in this specific area. Obviously the east end of this farm looks fairly dry which is on the top end of your screen. The center is very wet with room for improvement. The west end is also wet on the bottom of the screen though it's a higher elevation so I wouldn't think that drainage tile would actually pay as quickly as it would in the center of this farm and on the east end. Your darker soils that are more swampy are the ones where you're going to see the quickest return on investment on drainage systems. I've said that a million times and I'll continue to say that. That's why I'm looking for areas that have the biggest issues because that's where you can pay for very expensive tile installation very quickly. Just for fun, while I've got the drone up here, if you look all the way up in the top center of your screen, that is our main farmstead right there, right before you hit the trees in this video. Obviously this area is fairly flat where we farm at. There's a good assortment of soil types though. A lot of those soils are highly productive, but could use a little help in drainage. That pond you see on the right corner of the screen, that is an old gravel pit. They got landlocked by all of the farmers who wouldn't sell them land, so they had to cease production of gravel there because they literally could not expand anymore. Darn those pesky farmers who own all the way around them. I'm pretty sure there's only two or three landowners that cover that entire place, and we're one of them. This flight path isn't really relevant to anything other than just kind of showcasing what everything looks like today and maybe the relevance of the farm we're looking at now compared to where our main farmstead is. Speaking of this old defunct gravel pit, there's actually been a fairly interesting development out here over the last three or four months. The owners, who have every right to do with their property as they please, have leased their lot out on the gravel pit to PAR, 
to be used as a staging ground for replacement electrical high voltage poles to the south of us. So they've been unloading big metal poles out here, spools of wire, and had all sorts of people working for the last couple months. It's quite the change of pace considering this place used to just be empty and now they got all this going on. Eventually this crew will pack up and leave because they only need this for as long as they're replacing those power poles. I wouldn't imagine they'd be here for much longer than another couple months, depending on if the weather cooperates. I'll only make you sit through one more drone presentation of drainage out on our farm, and it's going to be here behind our homestead. We've got close to a thousand acres, give or take, in the area. The only person who cares more about this land than us are all of the solar panel leasing people who are just wetting their pants thinking of how nice this would look in solar panels. Probably not going to happen, seeing as we've been farming this for 174 years now. Here we are on the south side of our main property. We've got a 70 acre field right here. It's a pretty mixed soil type across the farm. The left half or the west part of it is a darker soil that drains well. You can see some laterals there. The right half is a much lighter clay, doesn't drain very well, and it also has some erosion potential, so you can see some terraces in the bottom right and top right portion of this farm. The other fun fact about this one, which makes all of these drainage systems even more complicated, is that going from the left to the middle right of the screen is an anhydrous ammonia pipeline, and on the top right of the screen, in that opening in the trees you can see across the top right corner of this specific farm and even cutting back into those farms further to the north is the trunk line pipeline. So we've got natural gas pipelines running northwest across the northeast corner and we've got an anhydrous ammonia pipeline cutting across the south side of this farm. Basically it is a contractor's worst nightmare and that is a lot of locating for your locating service because there's a lot of lines out here and you don't want to hit any of them. If I had to pick one though, I'd probably rather hit the anhydrous line than the natural gas line. I would say though that you would just want to avoid any kind of lost time accidents altogether out here. I'm still to the south of our farm, just panning slowly to the west or the left side of the screen. I'm not looking at any field in particular because there's a lot of fields and acres to cover here. I just wanted to showcase you guys the difference in drainage. Some of what you're seeing, like I said, are tile systems. Other things are just soil type diversity and elevation changes. Those can all make vast differences in how the farm drains. For instance, this farm in the bottom left corner of the screen has a lighter topsoil along with some gravelly and sandy subsoil, probably why they wanted it for their gravel pit expansion. You cross that little lane to the north, you're looking at a dark drummer flanagan, highly productive silty clay loam that can produce some of the best crops in the world in that short of a distance. The reason you see so much variation here on our farm is because we're located right on the edge of a glacial moraine. The glaciers that formed a lot of the soil over the years came back and forth down here, and this was one of their stopping points. It created elevation changes, a very large variation in soil types, and a few other issues. I guess issues is not the correct word. Let's just call them side effects of creation, because we've got a lot of those out here. This farm that I'm looking at in particular, the 220 acre field to the north, is a prime candidate for more drainage. We actually did a lot of supplemental work out there this fall, ran some laterals on the north side of that lane. That should dry it out a little bit, though there is definitely room for further improvement. You can never have too much tile. That's pretty much the message I'm going to send you home with today. When you're farming these silty clay loams and even some of these heavy clays, tile systems can pay. And it's very evident, if not right now, when you take your combine out there and you look at the yield monitor. My drone's probably fairly happy to be landing for the day because it's getting really windy. As a matter of fact, we actually have a wind warning through Saturday, which is two days from now, calling for gusts up to 50, 60 mile an hour. It's not really anything that caused any damage beyond maybe an odd tree falling here and there, but it's enough to be a pain in the rear end, that's for sure. It doesn't really take much wind to get annoyed. That's how I feel. And I'm just getting warmed up because I'm really not going to like the wind once I get this sprayer. Sprayers and wind, they don't go together. For reasons you probably don't have to be that intelligent to understand. If you haven't gathered already, my to-do list for this planting season has gotten fairly narrow. 
Obviously, there's a ton of things on there with the sprayer that need to be done, but it's hard to check any of those off when we literally don't even have the sprayer. I'm not too alarmed about that. I've got my finger on the trigger, all of my supplies ready to go, but I do have a few things on the planner I want to knock out real quick. Mainly cleaning up the hydraulic lines in the back a little bit more so we don't end up with a pesky blown line. I also still need to get GPS offsets from another farmer that runs a similar rig. I just haven't gotten to that yet. Those two things are really the only thing holding us back from planning. And these bungee cords that I picked up are really a debatable issue. We could run with the hoses the way they are, it's just not the best long-term solution. I've got to do the limbo real quick to get around Dad's tie job. We've chained the doors on the barn to the exact emerge planner because they're calling for fairly severe storms tomorrow. The weather service has given us an enhanced risk for severe storms, the possibility of mild tornadoes, and also a slim chance of severe tornadoes, which is not really the forecast you wanna hear. I would think that at the bare minimum, if we get some strong winds or a tornado through here, at least we won't have to go far to pick up our doors. And if we do, we may be going a long way to pick up our planner too. I wouldn't wish that on anyone, so not really gonna talk about that anymore but I will keep you updated as to whether or not those storms amount to much. Usually forecasts never come to fruition, especially when it comes to tornadoes. If you end up on the bad end of one of those though, it's not gonna be fun. We've seen that in the news over the last couple of weeks with those families down in Mississippi that really got a bad one. Wish them the best of luck and hope everyone stays safe tomorrow here in central Illinois. It's almost sickening to think about the monetary value that would be lost if a tornado rolled through this machine shed. Now, I'm not saying that to brag, but we saw a couple years ago in December some farmers get hit really hard with tornadoes around here and think about all the damage there was. Just these two planters and tractors alone are pushing seven figures, if not higher. We've got combines in here, big tractors. It would be quite the kick in the nads for us, especially with planting season right on the horizon. Like I said, hope nothing comes of it. We always pray that nothing like that occurs, but you never know what God has in store. Probably hard for you guys to tell because the camera enhances the exposure so it looks like it's brighter than it is. Our lighting in this barn is actually rather terrible. I'm working on ambient lighting right now with the help of my flashlight there standing on the planter. I don't have a goonie yet to hold the flashlight for me. But I'm trying to get this all squared away so we don't have to worry about it. Taking the three point off was obviously the best choice for safety for this cylinder right here. I don't know though if it was the best choice for having options to mount your hydraulic lines because that is where I would secure a majority of the things I had. I don't really have that option now. So we're gonna have to get creative. Actually, that may just work. I think the only thing I have going on here is a colorful mess and possibly a blind eye waiting to happen. That's going to be good enough for now. We'll keep an eye on it as we get into the fields, which seems like it's approaching quickly. I'm sure Mother Nature will change her plans faster than I can and make it so we're not planting until May. But we can hope. We can stay optimistic. For the sake of reliability, I'm actually just going to leave a couple extra of these bungees strapped on here. They're not really going to be in the way, and if I find that something's rubbing, not only on the hydraulics, but maybe on the back with some of my seed tubes or vacuum lines, I can pin them up with these. And since they have these carabiner hooks on them, they're not going to go anywhere. Is it me, or does this tire look kind of low? Could be an optical illusion caused by that slim little shadow on the bottom. Probably should look at it though, once we get this out. To be fair, I'd be looking a little down too after sitting in the shed for all this time, holding the weight of this on your drawbar. It could just have a little bit of a lump in it. Tractor looks clean though. What more could you ask for? Ready to hit the fields if you guys couldn't tell. Oh, good luck, buddy. I'm assuming you're not gonna need it, but just in case you do, 
Hold on tight. Since it's fairly windy outside and I'm probably not going to do anything too productive from this point on this afternoon, and of course the fact that I'm trying to keep the videos a little bit shorter, I'm going to go ahead and end this episode right here. I greatly appreciate every single one of you continuing to tune in and support the channel. Your viewership means the world to me. I'll catch you all in the next episode. Until then, make sure you like the video if you enjoyed it, subscribe if you want to see more, and comment down below if you have any questions. You know I love to talk about farming. Have a great day everyone. Peace!